The Detective's Daughter was a massive bestseller. It was an Amazon number one for 10 weeks, which was the longest running number one that year. And it kept a certain J.K. Rowling, a.k.a. Robert Galbraith, into number two position. So what about that? introduces readers to Stella Darnell, who is the owner of a cleaning company and a woman who strides through life, taking no prisoners, and to date, uh, when we meet her, making very few close friends. Stella's father, Terry, has just died, and uh, in fact, that's a cameo appearance for the Seaford Co-op, which doesn't appear in enough books, in my opinion, uh, but that's where Terry dies. And when cleaning out the house, Stella learns that he's been haunted by a past case he was unable to solve. The cold case leads Stella to Jack, the dead woman's son. Can we say about Jack Harmon, tube driver, a believer in signs, symbols, and ghosts, and a man who can live in your house without you ever being aware of it? I have to say that when I first read about Jack, I used to worry that he'd turn up in my bedroom. Yes. And now I really hope he would. Yeah. And you can make of that what you will. Um, so, in Stella and Jack, in my opinion, you want to have one of the great crime writing duos. Actually, a great cleaning duo, too, aren't they, Leslie? Um, Stella's kind of crisp efficiency is balanced by Jack's otherworldliness, her pessimism by his essential sweetness, and they both change and develop in the course of the six books. Um, can their relationship ever be more than friendship? Well, you will have to read The Death Chamber to find out. In The Death Chamber, which is book number six, Stella's visited by another detective's daughter who wants her to solve a 40-year-old murder and clear her dying father's name in the process. The, Stella, the trail leads Stella to Winchcombe in Gloucestershire, which is a place Leslie um, and Mel know very well. And to one of my favorite things in the whole of literature, which is two people marooned together in an isolated house. And in fact, the Sunday Express this week said that the death chamber is in the best traditions of the classic whodunit, Midsummer Murder for Grown Ups. <laughs> and I really, um, I can't say better than that really, because it's a wonderful thing. So if you haven't read the Detective Daughter books, what are you waiting for? If you have, you'll know just what I mean. Ian Rankin said that Leslie Thompson is a class above, and he's right. A fan said to Leslie on Twitter yesterday, do I really have to wait a year till the next one? Well, I'm afraid we do. But the good news is that Leslie is writing it now. Well, obviously not now, unless Alfred's doing it at home. Um, it's called The Playground Murders, and will be out in April 2019. And I am going to read from the beginning of The Death Chamber. Cassie Baker, who's 18, has been at a dance to celebrate the Queen's Silver Jubilee. Not something I was doing in 1977. <laughs> she is stumbling past St. Peter's Church when the bell strikes 10. Twice she veers off the curb into the road. The second time a car hoots and the driver swears. Her vision blurred by vodka with only one thing on her mind. Cassie is oblivious. Cassie Baker has known Winchcombe all her life. Her answer says a buried, head codes illegible, in the St. Peter's Church. Excuse me, I turned the page. It doesn't happen on the radio. In St. Peter's Church graveyard. <laughs> Numbered amongst the dead is Cassie's grandfather, who died a century ago of apoplexy in the doctor's surgery, now the Lloyd's Bank, on Abbey Terrace. Cassie's not going to let that happen to her. Being Donna Summer, she sings in perfect tune as she lurches down Vineyard Street, heading for her future. She pauses by the bridge over the River Isbourne and, briefly dizzied, leans on the parapet and gazes at the blackness below. Night, gorgeous. A man with a Sid Vicious hairdo and complexion, his arm round a woman with punky blue hair, whoops at Cassie. <coughs> his girlfriend elbows him and he gives an exaggerated groan. Years later, divorced him with a paunch, Kelvin Finch will claim the distinction of being the last person, apart from the murderer, to speak to Cassie Baker. Cassie wrenches off her shoes and carries them dangling by the straps. Making faster progress, she doesn't care that tiny stones cut her bare feet as she passes the gates to the castle. On the old Brockhampton Road, drifts of moonlight appear and disappear between clouds. Hawthorn hedges cast shadows so intense they might be chasms in the tarmac. Cassie's used to the dark. But tonight, a sudden fear prickles. Her dad drives home this way. What an idiot. If he sees her, where's your baby sister? Look at you, done up like a tart. She passes the field where, as a kid, she saw Bambi nibbling moss, or so her dad said. Then the five-bar gate with the outline of the strand of trees that march like soldiers. She'll take the shortcut at the next gate. Although winch comes in her bones, the morbid light presents dips 
and unclines that are foreign to her. She stops and looks back down the lane. Framed by branches is St. Peter's Church. The view adorns crinkle-cut postcards of Winchcombe, but now has the quality of a nightmare. Something's coming, her dad's van. Cassie flattens herself into the hedge. Headlights trace the twists and turns of the lane and rising from a hidden dip, they catch her and they glare. Bright lights blind her. The van judders to a stop. One brake light glows red. Boogie Nights is playing in Cassie's head. It's as if the figure coming towards her moves in time to the music. Mm -hmm.